welcome to the Beyond Barriers podcast. If you're an ambitious woman who wants to dominate your career, then you are in the right place. This podcast is co-hosted by Nikki Barua, digital innovator, serial entrepreneur, author, and speaker. And Monica Marquez, ex-Googler, diversity expert, and senior corporate leader. From inspiring stories to cutting-edge strategies, you'll learn how to develop the skill set, mindset, and tool set to get future ready fast and accelerate your success. Welcome to the Beyond Barriers podcast. Have you ever missed out on a career opportunity within your organization because you didn't know about it or not apply for a job because you doubted your qualifications? Well, that's exactly what we're going to help you with on today's show. Well, you'll learn about the power of community and your network, taking courageous leaps, and how to manage failure and step into your resiliency. Today, I have the honor and privilege of interviewing our guest, Charlene Gutierrez, who is a senior leader at Google, leading a team focused on fairness and equity in Google's talent processes. Charlene is a leading expert in diversity, equity, and inclusion. She has worked within multiple companies across industries to drive meaningful change towards greater fairness, equity, and workplace inclusion. In this episode, Charlene shares her story on how taking courageous leaps, even when she felt she wasn't ready, paved the way to uncover her superpower, and how her network of peers and mentors helped open the doors to opportunities that helped her accelerate her success and earn a seat at Google. Visit IamBeyondBarriers.com where you'll find show notes and links to all resources referenced in this episode, including the best way to get in touch with Charlene. Welcome, Charlene. Thank you so much for joining us on the Beyond Barriers podcast. Hi, Monica. Thank you for having me. I, um, I love what you and Nikki are doing with Beyond Barriers, and I'm so happy to be here to help contribute. Thank you. It's exciting, exciting stuff. So let's jump right in because I know that our audience is going to love listening to your story and all of the great advice you have to share with them. But um, let's kick off. Like, I know that you had a bit of an atypical um, entrance to the corporate world. So let's start with that. Share your story and, and what you've learned along that journey. Sure. Uh, well, it was pretty atypical in that it wasn't my original plan mm-hmm. and I didn't really have any connections. I'd spent some time in New York and mm-hmm. I'd fallen in love with the city. I loved the pace of it, the people. I loved um, that I could feel the city's energy in my bones mm-hmm. as soon as I walked out the door. Yes. And I just knew I wanted to be there. So when it came time to find a full time job after school, my one criteria was that it needed to be in New York. Okay. And that was, that was kind of, it didn't matter where or what I was doing. It re, you know, I just really wanted to be in New York. At the time, I was up to my ears in student debt. I mm-hmm. didn't have any financial support for my family and didn't have any connections to opportunities in the city. Mm-hmm. And so it felt like a bit of a stretch, to be honest. Mm-hmm. And I thought, well, naturally, and this totally dates me, what I need to do is go to the library and do some research. <laughs> and okay. so I did. I went to the library and I sat on the floor with, um, you might remember these, those very old kind of encyclopedia-like uh, career books. Yes. And I wrote down the phone number to every bank on Wall Street. Mm-hmm. I had decided that was the only way I could afford to live there and mm-hmm. pay my loans. And so I just proceeded to cold call every bank. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Okay. That, that's definitely courageous and definitely persistence, right? There's a lot of persistence in that. Yeah, it was something. Maybe determined. Mm-hmm. Um, and well, I dialed Goldman and mm-hmm. the receptionist transferred me to recruiting and I lucked out because the recruiter who answered was from the Carolinas. Mm-hmm. And she was very excited to hear from someone from the South. I was going to school in Nashville Mm -hmm. and she was thrilled and it kind of all just took off from there. Everything happened really quickly. I went in for my interviews and before I knew it, I was living and working in New York. That's an amazing story. So you set your goal. You said you knew New York was your goal. So you were, you broke it down and said, okay, how can I get there? And, and, 
you you definitely put a plan into place and and it panned out that's amazing so you 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 landed in Goldman and we all know that you know Goldman is notorious for having a really strong culture and really you know just a, a strong work ethic as well so tell me a little bit about what you learned um, you know starting off a, a career uh, in the corporate world at a place like Goldman Sachs yes um. Well, I did not know what I was getting myself into. Mm-hmm. That's for sure. I didn't, um, just because I didn't have any prior connections to the corporate world and certainly not to financial services, mm-hmm. I didn't know what it was going to be like. Mm-hmm. And I learned a lot while I was there. Um, I'd say I probably grew up a lot <laughs> while I was there yes, okay. as well. Um, one thing that stands out in my mind is the importance of having enough confidence in yourself to take mm-hmm. a leap. And um, I took those usually with my eyes open, but sometimes having them partially closed, Mm -hmm. I'd say. Um, And when I think about, for example, my career moves during my tenure there, they were often made because I was tapped by a former manager or leader with whom I'd interacted over the years. And in Mm -hmm. many of those instances, I knew very little about how to perform in the role I was being asked to consider. Mm. So I felt unprepared and unqualified and making the decision to accept the opportunity took mustering up some courage. Absolutely. Yes. So Monica, you've probably heard the statistic that men apply for a job when they meet only 60% of the qualifications. Yes. I'm very familiar with that statistic. Yes. And women apply only if they meet 100% of them. Exactly. And we miss out on so many opportunities because of that. We do, and I can completely relate to that data point. Um, For me, overcoming the insecurity of taking the leap Mm -hmm. meant shifting my mindset to a place where I held a higher value on the opportunity Mm -hmm. versus on how qualified I was for the job. And that wasn't always easy. I am very much grateful for the mentors who have encouraged me to take this perspective because without it, I would not have taken the leap that led me down the path that I'm in today around equity and inclusion. I loved how you flipped that fear of, you know, looking at the opportunity of, you know, what is the upside and what is the downside? And you know what, I'm going to go with the upside of the opportunity. So I really do love that point that you made that mindset is, is really key and just taking that leap of courage. Yeah, it doesn't always work out, right? <laughs> but, um, but, I <laughs> but you'll never know, right? Mm-hmm. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. It's like that uh, quote that says, you know, uh, doubt, uh, what is it? Self-doubt robs you of more opportunities than failure ever will. So, mm-hmm. you know, you don't take the opportunity, then you'll never know whether or not you failed. So, so kudos to you. So tell me more about, um, you know, the various different roles and where you landed with some of these opportunities. Well, my experience kind of runs the gamut in mostly in HR, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And I can tell you a little bit about how I landed in DNI. Yes, diversity and inclusion for those who aren't familiar with the acronym. Thank you. Yes. (laughs) Um, Well, it was 2001, Mm -hmm. and the markets were down. I was in a role where the majority of my day was spent conducting exit interviews. Not fun. And no, no. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and as a nation in a city, um, you know, we were literally in the midst of 9-11. Mm-hmm. <laughs> At the same time, um, my division in the company was going through a major reorganization. Mm-hmm. Um, to say it was rough is putting it mildly. There was a lot of uncertainty. Mm-hmm. And none of us knew kind of where we would land in the reorg. Um, on one day, I remember hearing from a former skip level leader who Mm -hmm. reached out to me about this new team Mm -hmm. that she was starting and asked uh, if I'd be interested in being part of it. The job was centered around diversity and inclusion. Mm -hmm. And I had no idea what that meant. Again, I felt (laughs) completely unqualified to pursue it. (laughs) But I said yes. Mm -hmm. And I said yes because of the leader who was calling me. You know, Mm -hmm. Melinda Wolf. I don't know if you overlapped with her during your Yes, I love Melinda. Yes, absolutely. She's fascinating. She's amazing. You should get her on your podcast. I will. I definitely will. Melinda. 
(laughs) She's someone who I still very much admire as a leader. She's inspiring and passionate, very values driven. And it was an incredible opportunity to work directly with her. And as it turned out, uh, it was actually a perfect role for me mm-hmm. <laughs> because I realized that this quest for fairness, equity, and inclusion has always been uh, part of my DNA, and mm-hmm. I just hadn't interpreted it that way. Right. Okay. Well, it is fascinating. Like you said, it's, you know, Belinda, who knew you, is somebody who probably saw uh, that talent or that, you know, raw talent in you and knew that you were a good fit. And like you said, you had that mindset again to just say yes, to to trust in that and to say yes and take that leap of faith and and take that opportunity, which again, yes, it landed you in your sweet spot, Charlene, because many, you know, you know, years later, you're still in that same d- diversity and inclusion space, wow. which is amazing. Yeah, I'm very grateful to Melinda. <laughs> So you mentioned roles being presented um, to you through your network or, you know, let's talk to our audience a little bit about the power of community, the power of your network and, and how all of these opportunities uh, many times are presented uh, to you. I mean, I think one of the fascinating statistics I found lately was that 70% of roles are filled through personal referrals. So um, it goes to show that community plays a really strong role in helping navigate your career. So share with us a little bit more about how that's impacted your career. Well, I, I didn't really understand the value of relationships in a person's career trajectory for a mm-hmm. long time. <laughs> it took mm-hmm. me a while to catch up. And it's, um, you know, a place where I'd say I still have some room for growth. I'm mm-hmm. not the person who jumps at the opportunity to network at large conferences. Mm-hmm. It usually makes me cringe. Um, <laughs> but I know that it's important. And mm-hmm. when I look back on my career, Every opportunity that I've had, even across industries, were Mm -hmm. a result of someone in my network reaching out. Mm -hmm. Uh, I actually even think back to my path to Google was through someone that I met at a conference. We both happened to speak on the same panel. Mm. And then years later, (laughs) we were working together. So if I were to think about advice Um, I would say understanding your networking style and considering how it works for you is Mm -hmm. something that's important. And also learning from people around, you know, there's a lot of research that's out there that talks about how men and women develop professional networks differently. Mm -hmm. And so it's important to know how you network, right? Right. Absolutely. Um, The research shows that men tend to be more calculated and Mm -hmm clear goal with clear goals in mind. Right. Okay. And they tend to have broader networks, Mm -hmm. uh, which I guess provides greater access to opportunity. Whereas women have smaller, deeper networks, usually Mm -hmm. driven through people they already know and trust. Right. Yes. There is a strong sense of trust, like that deeper relationships. I agree with you. Absolutely. I also think it's important to consider where you are in your career and what you're hoping to achieve through your network. A mm-hmm. recent study came out of Kellogg School of Management that supports a small, tight-knit network of females as being particularly important to women. Now, this research study was conducted on students, you know, with mm-hmm. students who were looking for their first opportunity out of school. So we need to add that lens to it, right? Right, okay. Um, what they were looking at in particular was what link exists between students' graduate school social networks and their placement into leadership positions Mm -hmm. of varying levels of authority in a company. Not surprisingly, they found that students' social networks actually strongly predict their placement into leadership roles. Fascinating. Mm -hmm. But interestingly, there's greater benefit for women. Huh. So actually, 77% of the highest achieving women had strong ties with female not male dominated inner circles of two or three women, which I think is a fascinating point. Yes. So they had a strong relationship with a female that landed them in that, in that position right out of school. That's exactly. That's, mm-hmm, okay. I think that's fascinating because we know that the majority of people who hold high level positions in large organizations are men. Yes. Often white men. Mm-hmm. And so I find this 
particularly interesting. I'm also curious about how the results would differ if we applied intersection, uh, intersectionality as a lens. Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, because we know that women of color often face barriers that white women don't. Correct. And so I wonder if we were looking at, again at that inner circle of two or three, if it would be more beneficial for women of color to place greater weight on a network with other women of color versus white women. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I can get a little heady when it comes to digging into all yeah. the data. I no, think the too. point of this. <laughs> <laughs> My brain is spinning too, wanting to yeah. dig into that a little deeper. I'm right there with you. <laughs> um, I guess the, the point is kind of consider how you network in what point in your career. Mm-hmm. Learn from those around you. These research, research studies are fascinating. Um, right. And think about what it is that you want to achieve. Exactly. I mean, I think it is really important to think about who's in your network and maybe who you need to pull into your network, like you said, in terms of getting some really key relationships and fostering those relationships uh, so that they can they can certainly help you. Um, and particularly, like you said, for women of color, really trying to understand, you know, the relationships that you have, making sure to look out and, and looking beyond, right? What is that degree of separation between where you want to be and do they can they help you maybe acquire additional relationships that'll get you there so yes 100 yes. percent. when I work with mentees I encourage them to think about networking or their community in three separate buckets mm-hmm. the first being who in their network will provide them with information about opportunities mm-hmm. the second being who in their network work will provide advice on feedback. So that's like, mm, you know, yes. how are you performing in your role? You really need the critical feedback in order to. Right. Um, well, feedback is a well. gift. Yes. It's it a gift. is. And you don't always need it from your manager, right? They need right. to be able to go complain to me <laughs> and complain about me with, uh, with somebody else. Mm-hmm. Um, and then thirdly, who in their network will support them as sponsors in critical points in their career, like promotions. Mm hmm. So three buckets, who will provide information about opportunities, Mm -hmm. who will provide advice, and who will support them as sponsors. I love that. It's very easy and tangible. And I I can't reiterate the fact on feedback because, um, as you know, too, statistics show that women don't get um, as much critical feedback as they need because, um, you know, when in conversations with male leaders, male managers, they're always... They're always, I, w- I would say, maybe shy or not shy, but afraid to give true critical feedback uh, to women because they're afraid how women will react or, or, you know, get upset. I can remember early on in my career uh, telling one of my managers who I said, listen, just give me the feedback. I may tear up, but don't let that stop you. Just give it to me the way that I need to hear it so that I can fix whatever it is that I need. And that gave him the permission to say, okay, well, he rolled up his sleeves and he just gave it all to me. But I couldn't be more thankful for him because it really did help me accelerate my career. So truly, you know, bottom line is don't underestimate that power of community and network and really leveraging them for those three things that you mentioned in terms of thinking about where are the opportunities I need the feedback from them. And also, who are the people, who are those sponsors who are going to go to bat for you uh, behind closed doors when you're not in that room? So again, the network will really accelerate your success if you really do tap into all of its resources. I love that. Thank you, Charlene. So changing, let's shift gears a little bit. Tell me about, you know, you, you had all of these different uh, opportunities. You've landed in roles because of the leaps of faith that you took. Um, how did you discover your superpower or that skill that just really elevated you and helped you accelerate your career? Well, I think in part, um, I was told my superpower, <laughs> right? And I think, you know, over time, you also get to know yourself and your strengths and Mm -hmm. where you really excel and when you're being tapped, why you're being tapped, Mm -hmm. what you're being asked to do. Uh, I think one of those for me is curating high-performing teams to Mm -hmm. very specific business goals. I like to carefully select a combination of people who either have skills for a specific system to solve a specific problem Mm -hmm. or people who have a track record of success in something else totally different 
mm-hmm. but coupled with a degree of transferable skills and passion for what we're trying to do. Right. Because okay. I'm a firm believer in bringing together a variety of perspectives and experiences to get results. Mm. So um, that's one area. And then the other area that has also been raised to me is uh, developing talent one on one. And I think that that is a strength because my approach tends to be holistic. Mm -hmm. Uh, When we're having career conversations, I like to know about what's happening at work and outside of work and what are their goals even after this job. I think right. it's really important to think about the long term and I'm not offended that you know someone is going to work with me for a while and then move on to do something else. That's mm. how it ought to be. Right, absolutely. also be doing the same. <laughs> and, <laughs> so I think people appreciate that. And um, I think coaching and mentoring your team and helping developing talent is a skill that takes time and practice. And so for me, that is something that I prioritize. I'm always looking for opportunities to deepen that skill, whether Mm -hmm. it's through um, external coursework or learning from others and also to practice. Mm -hmm. So whether it's with my team or with others who reach out to me or even um, I volunteer as a um, Google career guru. So Mm -hmm. it's this program that we have at Google where you can um, be accepted to be what's essentially a career coach to other Mm -hmm. Googlers. And I specifically enjoy supporting women uh, and career-minded parents. I love that. I love that program. And I remember in my time at Google also uh, taking advantage of that that opportunity because there are so many amazing people who volunteer to be tech gurus. And then also being a tech guru myself and being able to help individuals, um, you know, and, and just in somewhat paying it forward, right? Like lessons learned, like don't do what I did. <laughs> do, yeah. do, do something different. Tell me a little bit more about... Um, The advice that you give career minded parents, because, you know, it does bring into, you know, this, this perspective of competing priorities. And I think a lot of our listeners would really appreciate hearing a little bit about um, advice from you on what you think or how you solved, you know, working uh, full time at an organization like Google and Goldman Sachs and how you managed competing priorities and how they changed, right? Um, Pre- children and post children. So uh, <laughs> how, how does, how did you manage that? Well, I think it's highly personal mm-hmm. and um, it's hard to say that, you know, one size fits all when it comes to how to juggle everything. And certainly, as you mentioned, priorities uh, shift before and after children um, in the process of actually you know, growing a child in your body. (laughs) Right. (laughs) There's there's a lot that happens over the course of that process. Mm -hmm. And it's different, different for everybody. Um, If I had to generalize, I'd say there are probably three things that have helped me Mm -hmm. as a mother who is career minded in demanding organizations. Mm -hmm. Um, One is prioritization. Mm Mm-hmm. I think as a working parent, it's easy to get pulled in many, many different directions. Like there's a deadline at work. My client needs this. There's a school event. My partner wants to go out on a date night. I'd Mm -hmm. like to get some sleep at some point or fit in a workout. Um, (laughs) There's a lot going on. Yes. And you have to take time to prioritize what is important. And for me, that means doing it in chunks that are digestible. I can't Mm -hmm. plan for the entire year, but I can plan for this month. I Mm -hmm. can plan for this week. And I tried to keep in mind that priorities will change. So maybe this week I need to spend time at client dinners. Mm -hmm. And so then next week I'll help picking the kids up at school more often. Right. Um, I also think that for me under this idea of priorities, something that's important is non-negotiables. That's important. Yes. Yes. Like the items that come first always. Mm Mm-hmm. And those you can't waver on. Those mm-hmm. are the things that are really, really important to you. For me, those are things like um, like kindergarten graduation or performances or recitals at school or parent-teacher mm-hmm. meetings. Or if my child is very, very, very sick, mm-hmm. then you know, I need to be at home caring for that child. Right. Um, those are, you know, non-negotiables are very important for you to know. And I think uh, to serve as an anchor as you're determining your priorities. In other words, boundaries, setting boundaries that you know are non-negotiable. 
Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So that's one prioritization. The second one would be expectation setting. Mm -hmm. So the idea in my mind is once I know my priorities, I need to commit to them. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I can't keep wavering back and forth. (laughs) That's not always easy either. Commitment is key. (laughs) Yes, yes. Commitment is key. And, you know, in part, I'm setting expectations for myself so that I don't find myself feeling guilty or disappointed later. Mm -hmm. Right. And then I have to let go. So if, for example, my priority for this month means that I need my partner to make sure that dinner is ready every Tuesday. Mm -hmm. And every Tuesday, he decides to bring takeout hamburgers for dinner Uh the entire month. And that's not what I want my children eating. I just have to go with it, right? Right. Because I know that next month, my priorities will be different and we won't be eating takeout hamburgers. Right, okay. Right? (laughs) Right. You just have to, I think... Know what your priorities are, commit to them, and then let go when things are not exactly the way you want them, right? Right. You can't like okay. micromanage every area of your life. And then the second item under expectation setting is set expectations that others will have of you. Mm-hmm. So let your kids know that this week you're going to be working on some evenings and you know, over the weekend we'll do something special. You right. Like let them know up front so that at least in my house there isn't a lot of, you know crying and <laughs> happening when mom's not home for, for bedtime every single night. Right. Okay. And then the third item I'd say is kindness and forgiveness. Again, mm. something that's not easy. This is yes. for yourself, uh-huh. right? Because we're all human. We're fallible. We can't do it all. Um, and so you have to know that at some point you're going to mess up. And in those moments, you know, just be kind to yourself and forgiving. I love the, the kindness and forgiveness because it's a little bit of that self-care as well of, you know, not beating yourself up. But I, you know, I can really appreciate, I think it's, it's amazing advice in terms of focusing on priority, prioritizing, um, setting expectations, which is key, and then kindness and forgiveness. And let's dig a little bit more into the whole kindness and forgiveness, because that's where you're saying, you know, there's moments where you're going to mess up, you can't do it all. So share with me a little bit about how you manage, you know, failure, what has helped you deal with and learn from failures or setbacks? Mm, This is such an important topic. And we're hearing about resilience everywhere. I Mm -hmm. think I just actually attended um, a speaker event at one of my children's school that was focused on resilience in children because it's really a skill that you have to develop early on. Mm -hmm. And so those of us who didn't um, are late to the game and have some catching up to do. Mm -hmm. And it can, you know, span from, you know, coping with the unexpected to just being able to effectively deal with stress, Mm. right? And Mm -hmm. being able to do that is shown to reduce anxiety and depression, which are major issues in our society today. Mm -hmm. Um, How to do that, I think, again, is like a personal recipe and you have Mm -hmm. to figure out what works for you. I hear about and have some experience with Mm -hmm. um, like meditation Mm. and being mindful, approaching life from a place of gratitude. Um, I work with my teams to try to celebrate our successes and Mm. acknowledge our failures. Um, I think there's a place for failure in the work that we do. I actually know some teams that have a ritual for how they manage through failures, kind of like a day of the dead kind of Mm -hmm. thing so that the projects are not forgotten. Right. Mm -hmm. So just um, knowing how to work through that Mm -hmm. and again, being kind to yourself is important. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's day to day. And I mean, I think we talked earlier again about making leaps Mm -hmm. and how some of times those don't work out Mm -hmm. and that can be tough. And I know um, that for me, I've struggled to let go sometimes, Mm -hmm. right? There's Mm -hmm. sometimes ego, some vulnerability, uh, Mm -hmm. or even like in this line of work, there's a drive to see change happen in the world and that can set you down like a ferociously determined path. Mm -hmm. You just don't want to let go and you have to pause and Mm -hmm. take a breath. Yes. Go to yoga, Mm -hmm. do whatever it is that gets you in the right place. Take a run, go hiking. Um, And remember that, you know, staying in the wrong role does not um, benefit anybody. It actually does a disservice to everyone involved and Mm -hmm. you have to be true to yourself and to the cause and do what's right. So I think in all these cases, there's an element of 
finding out what you can do independently, and then also recognizing that sometimes you need to ask for help or step mm-hmm. aside and figure out your own, you know, recipe for resilience. I love that. I love that. Let's shift gears a little bit and share with the audience. Um, let's share with the audience who is one powerful and influential person that you admire and would love to learn from. Hmm. There are a lot of them. Mm-hmm. Perhaps surprisingly, I choose Greta Thunberg. Mm-hmm. And Interesting. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I know. <laughs> Probably expect me to say, uh, I don't know, any number of leaders in the world, mm-hmm. um, political or corporate, et cetera. But I think that Greta is just utterly inspiring. Mm-hmm. She is so focused. She is determined. She is courageous. Mm-hmm. I love that she is not just comfortable, but unapologetic about who she is. Yes, and at such a young age, it's fascinating. It's unbelievable. Yes. I also love that she's been a source of controversy. Mm -hmm. Because in my mind, that means that she's actually reaching people. Yes. Mm -hmm. She's just done an amazing job of creating a movement Mm -hmm. and gaining followership on a global scale. Uh, I would, you know, I would love to learn from her. But, you know, she's a household name. She's not the only person of that generation that um, is out there taking action. Mm -hmm. They are, they are just all inspiring. I can think even within my own circle um, of one young lady who at eight created an Instagram called Worry for the World. Wow. And at eight years old, she was so concerned with Mm -hmm. climate change and the environment that she started an initiative at her school and created an Instagram account, obviously with the help of a parent. Mm -hmm. My own um, 10-year-old recently presented to his school principal on an immigration session that he wanted to lead in his classroom. I love that. Yes. You know, (laughs) it's adorable. He was just really upset Mm -hmm. about how children are being treated at the border. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I think that there is a generation of people who are not going to sit by on the sidelines observing injustice and poor decisions. They are Mm -hmm. going to act. Mm -hmm. And that generation gives me hope and I admire them. And I feel like I have a lot to learn from, from them. I love that. No, and I and I think this this next generation is definitely, um, you know, they are our future. And I see, like you, um, a lot of hope in in these young um, individuals because they are taking a stand, and and that's what we need. So more power to them, and and that's why here at Beyond Bears we want to um, empower these young women as well, and and have them, you know, learn from learn from our stories and what we did and what we should have done and don't do what we did kind of thing. So certainly appreciate um, someone like you, Charlene, taking the time to share your story. So with that and and in closing, um, can you share with us whether it be a habit or a hack or just what you feel is the key to continued acceleration in their success, especially in this age that is changing so quickly with technology? I'd say authenticity. Foster it, live it. When we talk about being successful in a digital world, I think that we tend to first turn our minds to social media and technology. And I'd offer that in addition, we keep human connection and interaction top of mind because it is our people who create, develop, sell, implement, you name it, whatever your business is, you know, people are behind it. And it's critical that they have the opportunity to bring their full self to work every day. I don't know what your experience has been with this, Monica. I can tell you from my personal experience that it is mentally taxing and takes an enormous amount of energy to check a portion of your identity at the door in the morning. When I think back early in my career, I received feedback about um, how often I smiled, which was too much. (laughs) (laughs) Wow, okay. Apparently, I couldn't be happy. Um, And I remember uh, being told that I had a hop in my step. Hmm. that uh, the cadence and like rhythm of my speech was very Mm -hmm. sing-songy. All all this feedback like had nothing to do with the results of my work. Mm -hmm. It all had to do with me assimilating to a company culture. Mm. Yes. And I'll tell you, that is very mentally taxing. Mm -hmm. 
right? To walk into a meeting stressed about the content and then also have to remind myself, don't smile, speak in bullets, use a monotone voice. I think at some point, at some point, like you've done it so often that it just becomes second nature. Right. Mm -hmm. But it does a disservice to our work because Mm -hmm. your mind is in more places than it ought to be. Mm -hmm. And it's very difficult for the people who are working to assimilate. I've seen it through my work. I've seen the toll that it can take on people and on the business. You know, there are real implications for not getting this right. So I think that in a digital age, you know, we have to remember the human aspects of our culture as well. And authenticity is a component of that. Your listeners may be sitting there thinking, well, that's a nice idea, but hey, you know, I live in the real world. How am I supposed to do this? In my view, this starts with company culture set by managers and leaders and to foster a culture that values authenticity. You can't just talk about it. You have to live it. From a manager perspective, I'd say, you know, there's probably three areas to start from. The first is visibly embracing difference. That means in meetings and public forums, demonstrate that you value different perspectives Lift voices that may not be heard naturally on your team. Encourage healthy, respectful debate as a norm. It's okay to disagree. It's okay to have a difference of opinion. Second, acknowledge your biases. We all come with our own unconscious bias. There's no way around it. It's a byproduct of our upbringing. It's what we're exposed to in our culture. It's not a bad thing, but our responsibility is to recognize it and to adjust accordingly. And the third would be, to the extent possible, create a psychologically safe environment where there's no fear of repercussion for being yourself. That is, again, not easy. None of this is easy. Um, and it may mean being vulnerable or putting yourself out there. But, you know, again, very important when it comes to creating a culture that values authenticity. And it doesn't stop with managers. All of us are responsible. Each one of us has to take responsibility for our own actions, for how we show up, for the role that we play in cultivating our office culture. And so the same is true for everyone as for our leaders. You know, check your bias, encourage psychologically safe environments, be open and respectful and generous. And, you know, of course, live into bringing your authentic self. So I would say authenticity is one way that as a collective, we could uh, move ahead. I couldn't agree with you more. I think that is extremely profound advice uh, for individuals to to heed. Um, And I couldn't thank you more for sharing with us and with our audience here at the Beyond Barriers podcast. And with that, I'm sure there's going to be several individuals who will want to connect with you. So share with our audience, what is the best way for uh, our listeners to connect with you? Mm, Well, I mentioned that networking is a growth area for me. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) With that, I will say LinkedIn is probably the best way Mm -hmm. to reach me, though Mm -hmm. don't look at my profile because it's not been updated. It doesn't have a photo. Mm -hmm. There aren't really many people with my name out there, so you'll find me. (laughs) And I'm pretty responsive. Well, that is homework for you. And we certainly at Beyond Bears will be having you, um, we'll check on you every now and then and be your accountability partner and helping you update that. But uh, again, appreciate all of your advice and all of the time that you have given us here at Beyond Barriers podcast. Thank you, Charlene. Thank you. Thanks for listening. There are thousands of podcasts out there and we are so grateful that you've chosen to listen to ours. Visit IamBeyondBarriers.com where you'll find show notes and links to all the resources referenced in this episode. And be sure to take the quiz on the website. Your score will tell you where you are, what helps you gain momentum, and what holds you back. You'll also get a free guide with cutting edge career strategies. We'd also love to hear from you. Share your comments and topic suggestions on IamBeyondBarriers.com and we'll be sure to address them in future episodes. If you enjoyed our show today, please subscribe and rate the podcast or just tell a friend about it. See you next episode.